Hi, folks. This is Ed Amorosa from Tag Cyber. We're going to be starting our webinar just momentarily. I'll, I'll give you a little summary of what we're going to be doing. Um, having a nice chat here about cyber insurance with um, a couple of my longtime friends. One is an industry icon who's been in and around uh, business and now it serves as the CISO for Sempra. So we're going to hear from Jim and also uh, a guy I've known a while and is one of my gurus when it comes to cyber insurance. He's been in the industry a while and um, and now is an entrepreneur. So you're going to have fun hearing from Anthony, but we'll give people a little chance to hop on. I see some people joining and a lot of you may be watching the replay of this. If you're watching the replay, you won't be able to ask a question live, but none of us are wallflowers. You should have no trouble finding Jim or Anthony or myself. If you're watching the replay and you have a question, just uh, you know, you can find us easily both on LinkedIn and on the internet. If you're here live, and where you are, then uh, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A and I'll watch this. We were joking before that I'm, uh, as a college professor, I've learned to teach and watch Q&A and chat all at the same time and, and do my best to monitor what's going on. But I want to welcome you to the discussion. I've been looking forward to this because our topic here is cyber insurance, but in the context of what we're referring to as operational resiliency, which I think is really intimate with cybersecurity. You know, you can almost argue that um, the two are very similar, if not intertwined. But what we're wondering and what we're going to discuss and what we want you to all chime in on as uh, participants here with us is this question of how, how do we get the, the best cyber insurance by using operational resilience, by having good behavior, and 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 what are the in, inner what's the interplay? And we're going to dance around all sorts of issues here, including you know maybe helping you get some insight into the industry. If you're like me, I'm a computer scientist, and I have been a CISO, and I've been, now I you know run an advisory research and advisory in cybersecurity. I'm no insurance expert, nor probably a lot of you. That's where people like Anthony really come in to help. But now you kind of have to become at least at least have a working understanding of it. You can't be a complete Luddite when it comes to insurance. So if you're here listening, either live or on recording, good call. I hope you stick with us. We're going to go about, you know, probably go another 40, 45 minutes or so with the topic. And um, with that, I think we'll jump right into it. What I'll do is I'll introduce and let the, the two guys say a little bit about what they're doing. And then we're going to go through three broad areas around the state of the industry, kind of how uh, resiliency and security interplay, and then what's real actionable guidance that we can give you on what you should be doing. That's roughly how we'll travel through the topics on our webinar. So if you're tracking, that's what that's how we'll be doing it. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Jim, I'm going to start with you. Why don't you, uh, you've had an illustrious career. Um, you've been in this business. Jim Doggett's been for, uh, you know, your whole career do doing some really interesting things. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your current role at uh, Sempris. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Ed. Um, yeah, I've been in the industry probably too long at this point, but we'll see. Um, started off most of my career, I spent at EY, uh, retired from there, both as an auditor and then as a security professional. From there, moved on to several uh, large companies where I did a CISO kind of role between JP Morgan, Kaiser Permanente, and then AIG. Um, all three of those learned a lot. Uh, and then now I've currently moved into a, a smaller company called Semperis. And that's part of the reason that I've moved in this direction is it's an area, at least from my perspective, that has been overlooked in the industry. And it's an area I think I need to focus on and help others in the industry sort of understand. And that's well, me. Glad that, glad that you'll, you will be our operational resiliency guru during our discussion here, because I, I fundamentally believe that Things like Active Directory and identity and so on. If there's, if you got one dollar to spend on security, I'm pretty sure that's the place to spend it. I hope you have more than a dollar, but if that's all you have, <laughs> that's probably the place to go. So we'll we'll be looking for your guidance in that area. So thanks for joining. And now my my friend Anthony uh, Dagstein, I've known for a while, and and as I said, is I, I wasn't kidding when I said is uh, my guru on cyber insurance. 
uh, Anthony. Well, so tell a little bit about the, your very fine background in this area and uh, and also your, your present position um, as an entrepreneur right now at uh, Converge. So love to hear about that as well. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the kind words and the opportunity and the Jim and the Semperus team for, for having me on. Um, yes, yeah, so I started out uh, my career in venture capital, focusing on emerging stage or emerging tech companies and biotech. Uh, got duped into insurance, as we say. Many of us haven't planned to go in insurance, but fell into it and found it to be a, a great industry where it brings together risk assessment and pricing and marketing and legal. So it's a really nice um, conglomerate of, of different disciplines. So I spent about 15 years at the Hartford and then at ACE, which is now Chubb. Um, due to that merger and was did a lot on the underwriting side, mainly on uh, the tech and cyber areas of insurance, uh, working with companies like Target and, and Office Depot and others, Anthem. Um, we can talk about that as we discuss. And then went to the brokerage and risk advisory side. So I led the global practices at both uh, Willis Towers Watson and then Lockton. Uh, and now, Ed, as you mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm the CEO and founder of Converge which is a cyber insurance provider, uh, focusing on cyber and technology insurance. Uh, but we have an interesting niche in partnered insurance where we work with MSPs and MSSPs and other security providers and also do warranty programs. So again, happy to be here and I look forward to this. Well, it's so good to have you here. And I'm gonna stay with you as we, as I wanna ask a little bit about sort of the state of the industry. Um, sure. Maybe you could provide just a few things that come to mind for you when someone asks you about the state of the industry, is it a brand new industry? Is it emerging? Is it approaching maturity? Is it a mess? Is it clean? Is it tidy? Help us understand, because for most of us, we all feel like we're outside the tent looking in a little bit. We have to buy policies or we have to advise on them. And, and, and usually, at least cybersecurity and say IT professionals, uh, we often feel a little bit uh, inadequate to do that. So get, give us a little 101 on the state of the industry, some things we should know about, and uh, and what comes to mind when people ask you that question. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you definitely use some uh, illustrious words, and, and I think all of them can apply. At times, it's neat and tidy. At times, it's a mess. We're kind of hopefully at the end of a mess and getting into neat and tidy. I mean, the funny thing about cyber insurance and depending on how you look at it. It's been around for about 20 years, maybe a little more than 20 years at this point. Um, but in the grand scheme of insurance and property insurance, and Lloyds of London insuring ships traveling across the world in the, the 17 and 1800s, um, it, it's just a blip on the radar. So it's still new, it's still maturing. Data hasn't been great. So I'd like to give a little bit of a, a quick history. So cyber insurance is a form of professional liability insurance. Professional liability insurance has been around for 20, 30, maybe 40 years. And usually it covers real estate agents for failing to disclose something. Somebody sues them about their house and it's really for financial damages. It's not like property if something breaks and it, and it fixes it. So professional liability insurance morphed into in the 90s into technology insurance, where if you were a software or hardware provider and your product failed to perform as intended and somebody sued you or brought a claim against you, it would cover that. So that really started to take off, especially in the early 2000s. What we saw in the early 2000s was more and more tech companies were emerging and buying this. It was called technology errors and emissions insurance. And it covered you for financial loss if your software or hardware didn't perform as intended. Now it started to get to be a very crowded marketplace. And I was at Hartford and then I got to, I'll just call it Chubb because that's what it's known as now. Um, and we were developing that product and it got very competitive. So we started adding little bells and whistles to the coverage, security liability, privacy liability. This is when California was emerging with some of their regulations. You saw hip and high tech really start to come into fruition around um, enforcement by the OCR. We said, look, we're not really seeing a lot of these events so we need to differentiate. Let's add some security coverage. So then as, as tablets and more publishers got to be online, we started to find some of these highly regulated com uh, companies and some of these media companies saying, we don't develop hardware or software, we don't manufacture hardware, we don't develop software, but we really want that security and privacy aspect of your coverage because we're publishing electronic materials. We're a bank and we're holding data and we saw what happened in California with certain da data breach issues. We saw healthcare companies and hospitals come to us and say, we don't want the tech E&O, the tech errors and emissions portion. We just want that cyber portion. 
So that's how the standalone cyber policy was born. It was data breach driven. It was really to cover notification and credit monitoring costs in the time when it was probably 18 states that had the laws. Sometimes you see a class action suit or a putative suit filed, wouldn't really see anything come of it. It was profitable, it was cool, it was fun. But in retrospect, Wayne Insurance had no clue what we were doing. So I mentioned the target breach. Target had a breach. Do you encrypt yes or no? Yes or no? Yes, they did, but they did it point of sale, not end to end. So that claim happened. It cost the insurance industry a lot of money. And it was a wake-up call. Was, we don't know what we're doing as the insurance industry. We need to partner with tech companies. So I think you start to see a lot more collaboration with technology companies to say what should be in place. And again, all data breach focused. Encryption, how are you storing things? What vendors are holding it? Are you using the cloud? That can be really scary, watch out. So this is around 2015, 2016. Well then fast forward about two years ago, maybe 18 months ago, we saw the rise of ransomware attacks. That turned the insurance industry to a fairly messy place because that is not data breach driven. There is all kinds of aspects to it. And it's not this wait three years for a class action suit to play out and then you get a claim. It is a quick ransomware hit, ransomware payment, business interruption. So this is why today and over the past year, if you unfortunately were involved in an insurance renewal for your cyber insurance, you saw prices skyrocket. You saw a ton of questions getting under the hood about security controls. Uh, and you also saw maybe coverage get stricter. You had a hard time renewing or buying a policy. So we're in a messy state. I think there's some lessons learned. I think we'll be in a messy state again because insurance is very reactionary. It was data breach. Now it's ransomware. What's the next threat? So we're just going to keep seeing the cyclical aspect of it. You know, I'm going to ask you a follow-up and then we, I'm going to ask Jim to comment on the same question here. But the follow-up is this. For people like myself, who are just business people, you know, I, I went to I went to Columbia Business School. I went to lectures on on this topic. What we learned then was, when you're defining and building an insurance product, you do a bunch of math used on, using data, like you know, the, in in life insurance, you have the actuarial tables, and and you do very precise mathematics, build a model. And then a product pops out where you can be profitable, but it also cuts risk and everybody wins. I'm just curious, like that image of this very accurate mathematics using data, is it like that in cyber or is it very different for cyber? So I'll answer that taking a step back. So it's like that in insurance, right? So when we talk about property insurance, how do we price property insurance? Well, we look at geography and, and wind storms and natural catastrophes. And what's the history? We can look back two, 300 years of recorded history and say, okay, probability of this happening can mean it's going to be a one in 20 year storm. And this is how much we charge an actuarial that tends to hold true. Now, lately things are changing and weather patterns are changing. So that's, that, that's the one caveat I'll give. Now you go to cyber and it's well, how much data do we really have? The industry was around 20 years. I would say we probably haven't collected really good data, except for in the past maybe eight, maybe 10 years being generous. And a lot of that was data breach driven. So when we were pricing, it was breach calculator. How many records do you hold? How much does it cost us per record in a claim? Maybe a few bucks. Multiply that. Hey, are you encrypting and doing a couple other things? Okay. And we think you'll have a one in three year event. So let's price it that way to make money because you have to be profitable being insurance to pay the claims. But now to your point around the data and the math, it's been flipped on its head because now all of a sudden it's ransomware. Well, we didn't price for that. Okay, well now we finally priced and premiums went up 100, 200, 300%. But what if something new happens? How do we price for that? So we really need to be on a mission as an industry to be more dynamic and understanding data threats and not waiting a quarter or two quarters or three quarters to see how your claims come out and then go back and reassess your pricing. It needs to be much more dynamic. Yeah. Now, Jim, same question. You, you've you been in tech and also spend time in the insurance industry. What, what do you think? Do you think that this is a precise enough area to write policies that are meaningful? Um, I, I'm not sure if it's precise enough yet to, again, the data I don't think is, is deep enough, or like you said, Anthony, is we don't have enough data, even on the other claims. Again, how do you really know what someone's security posture is? Asking a question, like you said earlier, do you encrypt data? Of course I encrypt my data, but I 
may not encrypt all the data or any question you ask, I can answer in a way. So until you get empirical data that really talks about what is your security posture, I think it makes it very, very difficult. But on the other hand too, here's sort of another side of this from the insurance industry as the, as the CISO role <laughs> and the need, having the need for insurance, one, I think it's absolutely necessary. I don't think you have a choice today. Your customers are expecting it. Your regulators are expecting it. Everyone, the board expects it. So, it, and again, it's just another piece of the puzzle on how you mitigate the risk of something bad happening. And the fact that your premiums are going up, actually, they should be going up in my perspective. You're covering something, you know, I've moved from a $100,000 house to a million dollar house. Claims today, if something goes bad, are huge. And yes, it's going to cost more to buy insurance doing that. Does that mean you don't get it? From my perspective, probably not. Uh, you still got to go. You got to consider that. You know, Jim, as a CISO, one of the things that I'm sure you spend a lot of time on is third party risk, you know, where you're dealing with risks that are occurring in a place that you don't control or manage yeah. your business with them. But you have to ask them. You have to ask your supplier, hey, you're doing this, doing that. And we tend to use questionnaires. You mentioned that a minute ago. Yeah. Does the insurance industry have an inherent problem here that is very related to that third party thing where an insurance underwriter just doesn't know yeah. what you're doing? And even if they ask you, just like with our third parties, I'm sure yeah. third parties you deal with, even if they say, yes, we do end to end encryption, they may not even know whether it <laughs> might be very innocently. Right answering wrong or something. Is that a problem we can ever fix or is this just welcome to just the way it's gonna be? Yeah, I, I think we can make a lot of progress. Let's put it that way. Uh, and I do think in this case, the problem is identical to using third parties. Yeah. You, I want to know is if the third party is controlled or not and how do I do that efficiently across a lot of potential vendors? And the only way I know, I mean, today we do some out, you know, you can hire a third party that come, you know, or, a service that comes in and looks at you from the outside, I think that adds a little value. But the real question to me would be, what few questions could I get real data on and actually from that interpret how secure a company is? And if I know that they're patching their systems every day, if I know that they've got pretty good controls over their privileged access, maybe that's an indicator they're mature enough to where I can take that risk. I don't know. Um, your other only other option I see is you start do, looking at third party reports like SOC 2s and all of that, which I think are helpful. But again, you've got to look at the scope of that and see what. So I, I don't think this is ever going to be perfect. I don't think, uh, you know, I, I, Anthony, you were talking about having 200 years of claims to really, you could be pretty accurate in that, even with the changing world. I don't know if we'll ever get there at that level because security changes too quickly, dramatically that I don't think you're gonna have that option to come back and uh, ever hone in precisely. I, I, I agree. I think because technology is evolving so much and we keep seeing different threats and hackers will evolve, it, it's hard to get statistical significance from certain data sets to, to apply more broadly. And, and I do think it needs to be something that's more dynamic, unfortunately. I mean. I'm an optimist at heart, and I hope the insurance industry can move to something more dynamic. It's the mission we're on. Can you look at rich data with companies and, and what you're seeing around configuration validations? I mean, we know companies have EDR, MDR deployed across the endpoints, but it's not all endpoints or it's misconfigured. So there's that aspect of how can you validate configurations in really unique ways? And then the other side of it, and you probably see this, I'm going to keep going back to property insurance because I don't think it's focused on enough as it should be, but you know, there's a school of thought, and we talk about sticks and carrots, whether it's insurance or security for the past, you know, decades. Um, but there's this idea of conditions precedent. And will your coverage kick in as long as you have things adequately configured in key controls? And you, know, you see that in the warranty space, um, which is pretty interesting to get access to warranties if you're a technology or cybersecurity provider of having correct configurations for that coverage to kick in. I think the, the same can be applied uh, in insurance as well. We see it in funds transfer fraud. You need voice verification. You need to have certain people sign off to it. You need to have it in writing. And then if money is stolen, you will get your insurance payment. So there's definitely similarities to be applied. Yeah. I think now's a good time. Maybe Corinna, you can um, pull up our survey. Let's ask um, 
folks listening. And again, it's a for people who are um, watching on uh, the replay, you'll have to um, sort of do the best you can to just um, watch the watch the answers that come in. But um, we've got a poll question that's asking about cyber insurance coverage and. Um, Karina, you can um, you can go ahead and um, uh, drop the poll question. We'll we'll come back to the answers in, in a minute. I know as panelists we're not allowed to vote here, so <laughs> but but it's a we'll we'll come back. I think what uh, what tends to happen with most um, most polls along this line is that we were talking before that for smaller companies, I think a, a, a surprisingly high percentage don't know. Like I think if you ask small, medium-sized business um, security teams, the the question of whether you have insurance cover coverage often comes back as I have no idea. Um, um, as you get a little bit larger, it, an interesting question, maybe something we can ask on a future uh, panel would be, if you have insurance and you're in security, are you paying for it? And Jim, I think you and I had both agreed that most of the time, or at least in most of the cases I've seen, the security team does not pay for the insurance. So it almost becomes a moot question whether you have it. If it's not affecting your budget, you don't mind. So I think it's a continuation of this discussion we're having that, man, is this evolving? And Anthony, would you agree this is a industry still figuring it out right now? Yeah, and you, so you bring up a good point around the, I don't know. I mean, there is the budget thing, but one thing, and I'll, I'll use this as a, public service announcement. And it is mainly for the smaller mid-sized companies where there's a security team in place, maybe it's within the IT team, and they're not sure if insurance is purchased. A lot of the claims that I've been involved in that really, really fall down and become a mess is when the security team and whoever is responding to the incident, if it's being done in-house, isn't aware of the insurance that's in place. And immediately they're going to put out the fire they're calling their vendors, their contacts, their friends, they're getting forensics involved, incident response. They might call some kind of, you know, whoever their outside counsel is to deal with this and start calling AGs or talking to them. And then all of a sudden it's like, man, we just spent $100,000 on this. Do we even have insurance? And then the COO or the risk manager or whoever's procuring the insurance says, yeah, we have cyber insurance. We've been buying it for years. Let me put the claim in. And then the insurance company says, well, we need to be notified first. You can't spend money before you, you call your vendors or we have this approved panel. You have to use our vendors. So the big PSA here is if, if it first ask the question, know if you're buying it, but make sure that the vendors that you have relationships with are aligned with the incident response vendors on your insurance prior to having that incident. Also, I, I would highly recommend too, that if you have insurance, as a CISO, you need to understand how that, the terms of that. So what are the expectations of what you should be doing in your security group so that you do qualify for insurance? Because the worst thing that can happen is you, you have insurance, you pay for it, then you find out your claim's not valid because you didn't do the right security things. And if you don't know that as a security person, it's sort of hard to do. You know, in re uh, reviewing the responses, what we've got is a two to one ratio, yes to no but an astounding 50% saying, I don't know. That may give people just participating in our webinar may not be in a position where they would know. It's probably, I'm sure someone in the company who does know. So somewhere someone knows, but it's interesting how many people who are interested in this topic don't know. I think it's a good, but it's, it's promising that there's two to one ratio, yes to no. So let's steer now toward uh, operational resiliency and, and cyber. And Jim, I'm going to ask you to be our guru here. I, I think most people, any stakeholder or, or observer in this industry, I count us all here as stakeholders for sure. We'd normally think that it's reasonable to think that if you do a better job operationally with security, resiliency, active directory, identity, the things you guys do well at Sempris, then that should reflect well on your cyber insurability. Has that been your experience? Like, do you see some people, for example, who literally can't even buy an insurance policy because they have poor cyber? What, what's your advice and guidance? And Anthony, I'm going to come to you with more or less the same question afterwards. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last probably four months talking with groups, CISO groups about security and cyber insurance seems to come up every time. And yes, uh, 
there is, I think in the industry as a whole, a fairly large concern over, will I qualify for insurance? It is hard. Uh, I can go back two years ago. It was literally a one page document, less than 10 questions that I could answer. Yes, no kind of questions. And I got, and I got cyber insurance. Today, when we go do it, it could be pages and pages. And they've even asked on one occasion, I've talked to one customer of ours, they've asked for documentation to prove it. So yes, I think the world is changing. Also, the context of what they're asking for is changing. They are, again, think of today, uh, in the past, I know Anthony, you were talking about, it used to be someone would steal data and you'd pay out a claim based on the amount of data. Ransomware is a whole different beast. When you go to ransomware, you're talking about the company not operating. You're talking about huge fines or huge amounts having to be paid for that ransomware. So the size of it, I think, has gone up. And as a result, I think the insurers are starting to look for what's causing that. And it's no longer just the endpoint. It's no longer this. They're actually going to where, well, and, and I'll use the example in this case of your identity system. If somebody attacks your identity system, locks it up, such as Active Directory, which I think roughly 90% of all major attacks today involve Active Directory, they lock that down. Your company's out of business uh, until you can get it back up. So in, I think insurers now are starting to say, well, what are you doing to prevent that? Are you putting controls in to actually prevent that from happening? Can you catch it if it is happening to minimize the damage? And then that last part of that leg is if you get ransomware, can you recover? And what you, what what time frame realistically can you? Because that affects the cost. So I, those are the three things that I think. And if you aren't thinking of that, and I will have to admit, even when I was at AIG, which is a big insurance <laughs> from a, even a cyber insurance, I as the CISO did not think of am I securing my identity systems? And I think that's an area that we've all, all of us now need to be thinking about, are those secure? Because if it gets hit, the damage can be quite severe. Anthony, as you chime in here, I wanna ask that you kind of focus on a couple of things. First off, for people watching, there's the perception that there's some threshold in terms of security and resiliency that you need to meet to get a policy. I'd like your thoughts on that. And second, I'd like your guidance. There's a lot of claims in the industry, oftentimes from vendors, not that Semperus is one of the wonderful vendors that I think really sheds light on this, but there's also ones that are out saying, hey, buy my widget and it'll cut your premiums in half. I, I, I've tended to not think that was reasonable um, when I hear it, but I'm, I'm also ask your thoughts on, on that as well. So insurability and then also the effect potentially on premiums. And, and by all means, get into some of the innovations that you put together in, in your company, if, it, if applicable. Yeah, no, look, there's a couple things definitely going on. I mean, as messy as the industry is, and I was painting the picture of trying to look back and figure out what happened and, and how bad is this? Uh, and Jim, to your point that it just, it, it was ransomware that really came up. That was a little bit of a different animal from data breach. The silver lining in all this, at least I like to think, is that the cyber insurance industry is starting to look almost like the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board. Like, okay, we need the airbags, we need the anti-lock brakes, we need the seatbelts. There's certain things that we really need for safety uh, to prevent an accident. And I think after a lot of the insurance companies started to do their root cause analysis of what was indicator of compromise, what really happened, what were the vulnerabilities, because they quickly started digging into this because suddenly they're paying checks all over the place for all this ransomware and it is causing companies pain. So there's probably about eight or nine key controls where the industry honed in on saying, this is what you need to have to be a better risk. And for me, a lot of the advice that when I was on the advisory side, it's yes, you need this for insurance, but put insurance aside, like take a note from the insurance industry. This is what they're seeing agnostic of any geography or industry. So do this and prioritize your security spend just to have better security to protect against ransomware. Now, the caveat to that is this is for ransomware and there's gonna be more threats. And I think the active directory and identity access management has definitely come to the top. That's where people are realizing, like some of those key controls are around privilege access management, multi-factor authentication, having true segmentation. And then it gets into some of the more resilience aspects of having an incident response plan and make sure it's tested. 
Uh, so there are definitely some key controls looking at RDP, do you have open ports? Are you patching? What's your patching cadence for CDEs? Things like that have definitely now gone to the top of the insurance application to say, we want to see yeses on there. Now, is it perfect? I think, you know, we talked a little bit about it before, but do you have EDR, yes or no? To Jim's point, yeah, I have EDR. This one group has EDR. We deployed it in this subsidiary, but do we have it properly configured and deployed across all endpoints? So. I mean, that's at least the mission that we have at Converge is to push that and getting better data and validation about what's really out there and partnering with the security field to really get richer data for better underwriting, more telemetry. I mean, that's our mission. So I don't think we're there yet, but these key controls, again, I'm just going to say they're the flavor of the year, but we'll see how things kind of evolve as we see more threats take place. Now, in terms of uh, your second question, I'm with you. We've seen a number of companies jump on the insurance bandwagon of, hey, we know what those key things are. Yeah. Use our solution and get, you know, get a deeper premium um, discount. All I'll say is make sure you're working with a good cyber insurance broker that knows the space, knows how to navigate and can help advise. I do think there's some really good brokerages out there where they do have some former security people that are now risk advisors and can really help navigate what should we do? Where should we spend? How do we get the best coverage and kind of bridge that gap between security and risk? You know, what we, and Jim and I were talking about this previously. What I've seen, and I'm curious if you guys would agree, are two scenarios. And I want to make sure we're crystal clear here because people listening are inundated with a lot of bad information here. And that's why I think this webinar is so cool. The first is, it is absolutely true that if you have bad security, you may not have an insurance company comfortable writing you a policy. So we would all agree that there's an interplay between the stuff we do and your ability to say, we call it cyber insurability. So anybody listening who thinks, ah, it doesn't matter what you buy, it really does. Like there's no question, because if you can't get a policy, that could have impact on your business. So that's number one. The second thing that I think maybe we've seen is that if you're at a certain level, and there's evidence of neglect or something, some data that becomes available or something that the insurance company decides needs to be done, that if you don't do, you may see things go higher. <laughs> like I don't think that that's a, an impossible scenario. I don't have a lot of cases where I've seen it, but that doesn't seem impossible. The one we're all waiting for, and maybe it'll be something that at Converge, you guys will do, or, or it may require innovation here, but we're all waiting for the interplay to, so that if I say I quit smoking, I get a lower premium. I get that, like I like to say, hey, I'm, I'm protecting my identity infrastructure and the, and the monthly payments go down. I think the industry, if you guys would both agree, we haven't matured to that point, but we want to get there. Am I saying this accurately? I think that's right, but I want to make sure. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I'm a big fan of, of good driver discounts. I mean, that's what we're going after. Some transparency around having these controls gets you a better rate, and here's why. And if you don't have controls, here's what it will cost you, and here's what your resulting premium will be. That is the mission. I, I think we'll get there fairly quickly. Yeah. The one piece where... You know, talking to a lot, a lot of people in the security field, though, is you won't get that dollar for dollar trade. off, Right. So we need to understand that, yes, you're going to deploy MFA. It's going to cost you X, but you might see your premium go down, you know, four figures instead of the five figures that you put into a multi-factor uh, yeah. enable. So hey. th there's that piece, which I think is going to be a little bit of, of not friction, but some overcoming. But I think we need to take a step in that direction as an industry yeah. to get more transparency around pricing and controls. It's a big deal for vendors who may be watching us right now, because by all means, as you're talking to your customers, bring up insurance. We want you to. This is an important part of our industry, but make sure you're being accurate. Like if you say, oh my gosh, like to, to Anthony's point, buy our MFA, and, oh, your premiums are going to go way down. That's kind of misleading. And and I think it's my, I, lo I love this Empress uh, sort of approach, because I've listened to the team and to your whole team, Jim, talk about this. And it really is a, a model where this is all the, the tailwinds are all flying in the same direction. We should be protecting our infrastructure, identity and active directory in particular, and the insurance companies want you doing that. It's going to make you more insurable. You're going to avoid different types of increases. And, and maybe as this thing matures, 
we will get to the point where there's more of a, a, a tighter yeah. connection between that. Does that sound, make sense, Jim? In your yeah, opinion? I'm a little less optimistic probably than Anthony that it's going to come soon. And that just may be me. I don't know. I'm maybe a little more of a pessimist. I don't. But I can say that, again, you improve controls, not for insurance. You improve controls so that your company's safer. The, the end result, yes, it allows you to get insurance, and that's a piece of it. But you should implement no control if it's not reducing the odds that you're going to have some incident. Because, again, insurance is one piece of the puzzle that helps you insure against it, just like your house. I, you still want to lock your freaking doors before. Just because you have insurance, you don't say, well, no big deal. So anyway, I, I think we're headed in that direction. I think we will, we have to get there at some point. Um, but I, the industry has been trying to figure out how do I actually accurately evaluate? And that's the hardest part. Anthony, I want to ask you a question everybody asks in this. And how, how do I know I'm getting a good deal? You know, and I guess the variables here are like your, the premiums, the terms, the deductible, the payout, all that stuff. You know, is, is it really come down to working with a good um, partner that understands this, making sure you have good advice? Because most people just won't be able to off the cuff know what's a good deal versus another. What would be your advice for someone who's watching us right now asking that question? And, and yeah, and you were, you're spot on. It is uh, having a good partner. So you have to partner with the right insurance broker or advisor that knows the space, partnering with the right insurance company. Gone are the days of, Hey, I need cyber insurance. I need $2 million in limits. I'm just going to buy from this company because I know the logo. Um, you need somebody to really help you look at what is your posture? What's your business operations? You need your coverage to align with your operations. That's number one. This is a business decision. You can buy all the privacy liability and security liability in the world, but if you're a SaaS-based company or you're a manufacturer, and there's a business interruption element to you not being able to do your business in a connected environment, your property policy is not gonna cover it. And that's one big misconception out there. So your broker needs to understand your business. And if you look at a cyber insurance policy, if, if you've been unfortunately uh, at, at the you know, demise of reading through one of these, um, there's a lot of elements of coverage. There could be up to 15 elements of coverage. So you need somebody to guide you for that. So that it's like the coverage is one piece, Having right premium that, that, that fits within a budget is the other one. Having the claim services and all of that incident response dovetail to your plan is another one. And by the way, some insurance companies give really good proactive services that are free or at a discount. You might get free fishing training for your first 100 employees. We've seen that out there in the marketplace. Small companies can take advantage of that. Save the three or four grand. Get the free training for the first 100. Uh, so it, again, it's a good partner to kind of help you navigate all of that. Does that make sense, Jim? Is, do you give comparable advice to someone that a, a having a good partner would make some sense here? Uh, I think it's absolutely essential. Again, uh, if, if you're only buying the insurance to check a compliance box off that makes someone happy, so be it. But hopefully most CISOs aren't into the compliance world of just that. They're actually trying to reduce the risk posture. If you get the right broker, in my opinion, anyway, they actually help steer you to improve your posture in the right way. Because guess what? They're focused on where the damage could be. You may not know that. So absolutely, I think it's trying to find the right one is, I don't think it's easy necessarily today. Because again, it's, there's, everyone's out there. I mean, just like you said, I buy this product and your insurance will go down. That, that, that's a fallacy too. But in insurance too, you're not just looking for the cheapest policy. You're looking for someone to partner with you. You know, I've got a question here that's come in and, and we're, we're filming this in, um, in early October, 2022. And just recently, a couple of days ago, might even been yesterday, um, the former CISO of, of a, of a company, large company was actually found guilty, convicted of uh, a reporting issue. And it begs some insurance questions that I'd like you guys both to maybe offer a little bit of guidance on. For CISOs who are watching, should they be thinking about, is there like cyber insurance for the CISO? Like, does that even, does that even make any sense? Anthony, maybe you can give a little bit of thought and then Jim, I'd like to hear your yeah. thoughts. It's like, should a CISO be buying some policy or does it banner in with the corporation or, how does that all that work? What would be your advice if like your brother was a CISO saying, hey, bro, what do I do? What would you say? 
No, I, I think it's a, a a really good, valid point. I mean, I, I was a risk advisor and broker in a previous life, and you know, the, the advice I give on this is ask the question of your company. Go to your risk manager or the the, the board or wherever you are in the organization. Find out: Am I protected if if something goes wrong? If it's negligent and and I'm involved in it, or I mean, there is elements of fraudulent coverage in policy. So if we start with a cyber policy, it is around negligence of protecting the organization from any kind of infiltration or or loss or compromise or even rogue employees. So you want to make sure that you have coverage as an employee for that. And even if you were a former employee, it tends to extend to you. There's ideas called severability, which means if there is fraudulent actions, it will cover you and defend you until proven guilty. So there's elements where you really want to make sure that you're covered in your role as an officer of the company protecting the organization. That would fall within the cyber policy. So ask the question, am I protected? Read the policy. It's going to get back to good broker um, guiding you and making sure you have the right coverage. But most policies as a blanket statement will cover you for the acts that you do as an individual on behalf of the company to protect the network and, and the data and, and the um, uh, integrity of the network that's there. You should also ask about directors and officers coverage. Directors and officers policy is exactly what it sounds like. It covers the directors and officers uh, on the board and, and within the organization of malfeasance and negligence and just overseeing and managing the company. Now, there should be elements of coverage there if you are a CISO and considered an officer of the company. So it's really depend on where your role is defined within the organization. Um, less so if it's at a, a different level within the organization, uh, but that's also worth asking the question. The one thing I'll say is we are starting to see some cyber exclusions go into these director and officer policies. So I'd really focus attention and are you covered under your cyber policy as an employee of the organization? And will you defend me if something happens? Jim, is that the right advice? Any thoughts that you might ha- have to add there? Yeah, I think he's dead on. Um, the simple answer I would say to this, as a CISO, and I would recommend to any CISO, if you're taking a job, you have to ask that question before you would get employed. If you do not have that coverage, you're sticking your neck out, not only just to get let go, which we all joke about, you know, that's first incidence as a CISO, you're going to be let go. But more so than that, you don't want, you could be personally liable. And that's not an option you could take. It's no different to me than if you're joining the HO, you know, a board member at an HOA function. I wouldn't take one of those unless I knew I had coverage. So this is something that you personally need to absolutely make sure you've got coverage, regardless of what size company you have. One thing I found enormously useful as I spent time, I spent 20 years in the CISO seat. Yeah. Um, I had an executive coach who was capable in the industry. And I like I do that now and there's others. I, I would say particularly for a younger CISO, man, having an executive coach seems like a real good idea. Somebody that is under NDA, knows the business, has been through the ropes. I, I couldn't imagine not having somebody that you can go bounce some ideas off yeah. of. You're, Even if you don't have any heart, yeah. you're already the cybersecurity yeah. expert in the company. Who do you talk to? You know, it's not yeah. even. You can also find mentors in the industry. It's amazing yeah. how many of us that are out there to help the next generation of CISOs out there. And we've got a lot of battle scars, <laughs> you know, Ed, you and that I. Is true. No, I agree. The trick with a coach is that they're under NDA. Correct. The advantage, like I've, I've done all of the above with, with outsiders, yes. asking groups and stuff. What I've found is that for me, when I'm asking a lot of my peers a question, I often get kind of space junk answers, but <laughs> somebody who is in under NDA, who knows what you're doing, it changes it. Like, because then that person has a stake. And I suspect would also feel some little piece of that liability as well, if they're advising, which is the whole idea, right? You want people yeah. to have skin in the game. So let's, let's close with, maybe you guys might have a couple of closing thoughts, maybe a little piece of advice. Anthony, we'll go with you first. Any, any final closing thoughts to um, people who are watching just something that they should leave. And then Jim, I'll, I'll, I'll let yeah. you close the session with your thoughts, but Anthony, any final advice? Yeah. Two, I mean, two quick bits off the top of my head. One is getting the right broker and take advantage of some of those proactive services. If you have cyber insurance and in my, in my history, I've seen about a three to 4% uptake rate of policyholders actually taking advantage of free stuff, save a little bit of cash in your, in your um, 
in your department and, and take advantage. That's one. Number two, I've been saying this for 20 years. I've been on insurance and cyber insurance uh, panels. Please have an incident response plan. Please test your incident response plan Amen. and actually utilize it and test it and make sure it's up to date. That's when things fall down. That's when you deal with OFAC issues and the U.S. Treasury. And I've been involved in a lot and it's messy. Just respond in the right manner and have it there in a plan. And I hope people will give you a call because you got a very cool startup company in this area. And I think you can be very helpful to enterprise teams. So thanks, Ed. I appreciate that. Thanks. Absolutely. And then Jim will give you the final word. All right. Sounds good. Um, I think that I, my recommendation to everyone is look at what the insurance folks that are providing these coverage, what are they looking at? Because it's very, they're, they're doing it from the perspective of they're trying to save themselves money which probably means it's the area you should be also focusing on too. Uh, so don't, again, don't think of them as just a cost. Think of them as someone who also can help you. And whether it's you, your insurer or someone else's insurer, pay attention to this industry. I think it can help you tremendously as to how you focus and also how you sell to your boards on what you need to focus on. That's wonderful. Well, listen, on behalf of all the people listening, my team at Tag Cyber, I want to first start by thanking uh, Karina for her help here in, in running the webinar. I want to thank the Sempris team for all the fine work organizing it and our two great experts. You guys are awesome. Thanks so much. I learned a lot and I have a feeling um, anybody listening either live now or in recording will also benefit considerably from what you guys shared. So thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Jim, for uh, joining us today. Thank, Thank you, you and Anthony, as well. Great. Thank for everyone you. else watching, have a great day. We'll see you next time. Take care. Take care.